So uh, the goal is, as we said actually when we started the meeting, that we wanted to actually think about research directions that would be driven by what we've heard at the meeting to date. And we've heard a lot of stuff at the meeting to date, so I think there's probably no shortage of potential research directions. Um, but in order to help frame our thinking about this, uh, we've got a couple of presentations scheduled, and then we'll have some time for discussion after we've heard those presentations. So I'll invite Mark Williams to give us his thoughts about uh, research on pre-testing phase. Thank you, Rex. I'm sorry, and I'm just going to moderate Rex. Um, so we're, we're going to have the presenters for this session present from their seats, and they can make some modifications to their slides as they go on. Right. So if during the presentation uh, I have not captured something, uh, or if I've missed something completely, um, then we'll have time uh, after the presentation to make sure and go back and edit that. The other thing is, is that um, as I was going through this, we had to go through an exercise of, well, is this pre-testing? Is this testing? Is this post? So uh, I would not necessarily assert that how, what I've identified as pre-testing is necessarily absolutely pre-testing. So at any rate. So um, it's a little bit sad that all of our engagement people are not engaged today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because um, uh, as I thought about this, I think this is really, for me, the most important takeaway. And I included a concept that Kareem Watson introduced in his talk at the ASHG meeting, uh, where he talked about engagement science. And I think this is kind of a transformational concept, much the way that the introduction of the term implementation science, you know, changed how we approach implementation, that there's actually a science around how we do engagement. And so as I think about research directions, I think we should try and embrace this emerging framework of engagement science and think about engagement across a number of different um, stakeholder types. So certainly patients, I think, is essential, uh, clinicians, uh, and other stakeholders, which would include systems, payers, uh, public health, et cetera, et cetera. And there were two graphics that I um, uh, wanted to steal here. One is we saw yesterday on the All of Us uh, presentation. This was also part of Kareem's presentation at ASHG, and I, I knew when I saw it that I needed to present it at this meeting because I think it's a really nice uh, outli uh, outline of the framework uh, that could be used uh, in terms of including engagement uh, through the nested levels of individual, interpersonal, institutional, community, and culture and society. Uh, and that we have these different uh, components, outreach and awareness, education, training, capacity building, bridging communities, and knowledge mobilization. So I think this is a really interesting framework that a lot of the pieces that I'm going to be talking about later could be mapped to. But then George Mensa uh, yesterday talked about um, uh, this uh, uh, dynamic relationship of meaningful community engagement, uh, which is something that's being incorporated through the National Academy of Medicine. And I went on to their site and um, looked at this, and I think that there are also some things from this framework uh, that um, could be applied. And I think the community engagement, while we might tend to think about that as, again, engagement with patients, I think we could define a whole number of different communities patient communities, clinician communities, um, uh, payer communities, where we could apply these core principles and develop alliances, expand our knowledge, improve our programs and policies, and ultimately uh, help them to thrive. So these are two that I wanted to include in my deck so that when that gets moved into the meeting materials, we can have those uh, as reference. So these will be the last two interesting slides that you'll see from me. Um, and then we'll get to the more text-based slide. So here's some things that I took away uh, from the meetings. Uh, research into a standardized approach to assessing the chain of probability to inform inclusion or exclusion of genes and variants for population screening. So from Les's talk, the practical probabilistic model of population screening, I immediately thought, well, this would be awesome. We could call this eBay's, but somebody already stole that name, so we can't call it that. <laughs> Um, 
The second is uh, a comment that um, Ned came up with as part of uh, as one of his questions, which is the idea that we need to have evidence-based medicine 2.0. Well, what does that look like? What should that look like? I think that's a really interesting concept because um, as I flash back to all of our time on the EGAP working group, uh, we've constantly beat our head against the wall of evidence-based medicine 1.0 and realized that it really couldn't uh, accommodate the sorts of things that we're doing. So I think that's another interesting area to explore. Um, I think we've heard uh, a lot of talks about how we need to define and harmonize uh, outcomes and costs, and I think in the last uh, discussion here, we heard about how it's going to be very important to define cost from a different stakeholder perspective. Uh, quality adjusted life years is a very different concept than per member per month, but those are going to resonate with different communities, so we need to understand that. Um, I've got a bar in front of my um, uh, thing here that's, oh, there we go. Okay, um, so definitions of thresholds of evidence. Um, we uh, talked about clinical utility, which must include benefits and harms. They're two sides of the same coin uh, to inform inclusion or exclusion of gene invariants. And again, uh, the idea that we have to have different perspectives on, uh, perspectives on these utilities we need to understand clinical test performance and the specific aspects beyond sensitivity and specificity, uh, including positive predictive value, negative predictive value, a number needed to screen uh, or uh, treat. Um, we need to understand the penetrance and natural history of conditions um, that are identified by, uh, that should be genomic screening. Uh, and as we heard today, we need to understand the timeline whereby that benefit is going to be realized because if we're dealing with a payer community, they may be looking at a one to two year timeline, whereas a public health community could tolerate from a societal perspective a 20 to 30 year timeline. Oops. Okay. Um, we have to uh, basically, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting boxes on my way here. Uh, research on what's needed for comprehensive and equitable implementation of population screening. We heard a lot about that. That was a theme that continued to um, uh, uh, rise up uh, throughout our discussions. Um, I think part of that is um, an opportunity to do pre-implementation research using some type of an evidence-based implementation framework like a CIFR or REAM or something of that nature. So that we basically, in as best as we can, uh, map out terra incognita before we begin to um, explore, recognizing that it'll be uh, only approximation, it'll be significantly wrong. Uh, California is not, in fact, separated from the United States. Only Baja California is, as an example. Uh, we have to, this is, and I thank Crystal Tsotsi for her help in crafting this next bullet. Um, focus on equity across multiple dimensions, uh, including innovation equity, deployment equity, contextual equity, and equity metrics in the context of population genomic screening through the many perspectives of different populations and communities. That was a very powerful um, theme, I think. Um, I love the idea that uh, Ned put forward, uh, which comes out of the newborn screening community, the idea, can we develop pilot studies uh, for population screening for near tier one conditions where we can get that last mile of evidence that's needed to potentially move them to tier one or to say, no, we, this evidence does not support this as inclusion. So I think that's a really um, interesting thing to explore in the pre-testing screening phase. Um, we need to engage with prevention, with the prevention research community to co-develop genomic prevention research projects. That was something that, again, was very interesting to me. People that do research in prevention uh, have a very different approach to how they uh, do study design uh, than those of us that are primarily in interventions. And so I think that's a uh, really uh, fruitful area to, uh, for pre-testing research. Population genomic screening in research settings compared with implementation of public health settings. Different rules, different regulations, different policies. So there's a policy research agenda to explore these differences within the context of implementation research. Uh, we heard today about developing some sort of a learning or sharing network to facilitate shared knowledge 
uh, how do we move from a successful project to wide-scale implementation. I think the um, um, uh, projects that are going to be involved in the new learning health care system uh, a cooperative agreement could be a potential test bed for some of these ideas. And then research, this is a sort of a stray cat that uh, uh, did come up and I thought it did need to be represented there, but it, it, it's uh, somewhat uh, more uh, limited, which is research into problems associated with using peripheral blood for screening, so, such as mosaicism, clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential and, and uh, use of other samples. Um, so I think that is the um, uh, list of things that I took away, so I'd be very interested um, in the couple, couple minutes left uh, related to my presentation, whether there's any modifications, anything I've missed, anything people want to add or subtract. M Mark, I think I'll, I'll start. One of the things that I think came up pretty clearly in the discussions yesterday uh, was the need for us to think about research programs that were uh, studying the biology of penetrance. And that certainly, I think, would fall into this category, uh, maybe more broadly even. Terry? Yeah, I was, I was, one, was wondering if, if somebody could talk about, either you or Ned or, or anyone, about what does evidence-based medicine 2.0 look like and who's going to develop it? So. I think that's the research question. What does evidence-based 2.0 look like? Uh, and, and um, you know, and Ned, you, I think, I, I don't think you have a, I think you have ideas, but I don't think you have any answer. No, I think, you know, over the past now maybe seven or eight years, I've been working with the National Academy, and they always call me up when, we need to redesign some evidence review and evidence to decision framework for something we don't have it for. And what that's done for me is kind of open up the door to thinking about um, how, where the problems with grade are, for example, in terms of um, bringing context into the message, how to deal with qualitative data, how to um, do qualitative data analysis and how that fits into an evidence to decision framework, how analogy and mechanistic data might fit into a recommendation. So <clears throat> I think uh, what I, I think GRADE has done a good job of thinking about new things, but without actually fleshing out or giving much in their, their very tight RCT-based framework. And I think the National Academy was interested in saying, <clears throat> you know, are there other ways to think about other kinds of evidence and, and bring them together in such a way that your certainty that you're doing more harm than good is high enough to get you over the hump to move forward. So I think there are new changes in evidence to decision frameworks. And you're right, thinking about what, what needs to have a fit for purpose approach for genetic testing would be a good research question. Um, I think it's implicit in what you said, Mark, but I wonder if it might be better explicit, which is I think one of the things we have to do as a genomics research community is move from disease-based cohort research study design to um, more less biased ascertainment study designs. and shifting our research base towards genomic ascertainment uh, is what we need to do in the research context to model what we want to do in the clinical context, which is find these diseases in populations. And you can never answer that question if you only study people who have the disease at the outset. Anyone else? Aaron. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, with that, then, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, and then the next presenter is Heidi Rem, who's going to talk about what tests to recommend and how are they offered and what types of results are provided. Okay, great. Um, 
So I'm going to talk about the research testing phase, what tests to recommend, how they are offered, and what types of results are provided. Um, so I, I was starting just to um, try to define the different types of tests in terms of intended use, and I defined three different buckets, a test with a single specific purpose, like a diagnostic panel or genome exome sequencing, a carrier screening test, the CDC tier one test, single drug pharmacogenomics, et cetera, versus what a lot of us do now is the opportunistic use of content from one test for a distinct purpose. So all of our secondary findings returns from exome genome is really just an opportunistic use of that data versus what's now becoming the increasing interest and focus, albeit challenges to get there, is broad tests with intended for multiple uses. So we run an exome or genome with the hope that we can use that in multiple ways, like virtual panels for distinct indications, be they symptom-based or screening. And those could be sequentially done or in parallel. So I think an area of research focus is really to define these or others I've missed types of tests and scenarios and how do they differ in sensitivity and cost um, under what context is each type offered to really think about how we offer screening population screening type tests and in what context and do we gain this efficiency or do we say oh, that just creates complexity and we need a dedicated test and we had a lot of discussion about that throughout the last two days so I think that's an area that really has to be tackled. Um, we also heard a fair bit about, you know, the uptake may relate to test complexity and the length and complexity of the consent process itself. So is this a very targeted hereditary breast and ovarian cancer test that a breast cancer surgeon orders? Or is it the whole cancer panel and then all of a sudden you get NF coming up when you started with breast cancer and that complexity? Or, you know, I talked to lots of the physicians who were ordering pharmacogenomics tests and asked, why don't you order the broad panel? You could use it for other things. And they say, I do not want the responsibility, liability for all the other results. So, like, how do we think about that? And then, of course, we've also heard um, physicians who simply aren't ordering exome or genome sequencing because they do not want to deal with the secondary findings return consent process um, and aborting a useful test for that reason. So. How do we think about making, reducing that complexity? And as we were talking about earlier today, standardizing the consent process to a minimum thing using CDS tools. So I think that's a whole area of work uh, and research to define how can we really do that effectively yet simply. Also, when is a genetic counselor or genetic counseling assistant needed? Do they have to be embedded in a clinic and hired by that clinic or can we use external, you know, counseling resources um, that may be in the same healthcare system, but not with the same clinic, sort of models of providing genetic counseling when needed, but not when not needed. Um, and how can we most efficiently transmit phenotype and the indication for testing this is a huge barrier to useful test interpretation. Um, less important if we're just talking about screening, but certainly if you're tagging on diagnostic aspects, that becomes critical. So that's a whole area I think that's important. Also, what level of certainty is needed to return results? And today we have this general sort of bifurcation. If it's symptomatic testing, you return VUS, likely path and path. Uh, if you're doing screening, secondary findings, and sort of findings, you only return likely path and path. And that's sort of typical, but um, we also have to think about um, uh, Sorry, just get rid of this thing that's obscuring half my slides. Okay, there we go. Um, thinking about the fact that most of variation that we detect and return to patients is rare, or unique to a family. Seventy, actually, I just calculated is actually seventy-eight percent of the over two million variants in Glenbar have only a single lab submission. And you know, if we return only pathogenic, those really well-supported variants. It will have a major negative impact on underrepresented populations. So how do we think about equitable interpretation and return uh, of content? Um, also, should we indicate the presence of a VUS on a screening report? Most labs do not do this, but I just more recently discovered that color health is indicating the presence of a VUS on screening reports. And they do it in a way that sort of 
isn't the specific variant. It's sort of a sub note. By the way, you have one or more VUSs that haven't been interpreted and put on this report. And that, at first, I was like, oh my God, what are you doing? Like, you can't do this. We don't return VUSs in screening. But they found that the shock of patients when a variant was updated was so significant that they needed to sort of preempt that expectation. And so they have started with this. But this is an area of ripe research, right? What is the best way to do this? They've tried it one way. Most others don't do it that way. But what's the right answer here? Um, and I will also say in the next sequence variant classification guidelines, as Les knows well, we will add VUS sub-tiers. And so this big, massive bucket in the middle between likely benign and likely path will get subdivided. So it's a huge opportunity to study what do we do with the, each of the sub-tiers? Do we put the US lows on reports? Do we put them in supplements? There's all sorts of things that can be done. And we have an ACMG work group that I'm co-chairing to put some guidance out, that, out there. But most of the guidance is going to be somebody needs to research the effective approaches to deal with these sub-tiers. Um, so that's a huge area for research. Um, and I will just put in some data. So we're fine. Yeah, this is data that we're assembling right now from Baylor, Mass General, Brigham, and Quest, um, all of whom have been already using VOS subtiers and showing the dramatic correlation with reclassification towards pathogenicity or benign. So if you're in the VOS low, almost no variant has ever moved to pathogenic. So this really can help us as lab or clinics are getting inundated with reclassification, 70% of variants at MGH in the cancer clinic got updated, and it's sending the physicians into a frenzy. Um, OK, there's also this really complex scenario. And if we were to think about carrier screening as an element of the population screening focus, um, the ACMG standards suggest that you report um, path and likely path variants, except that you should report VUS when the partner is positive for a path and likely path. Talk about that complexity. So most carrier screening happens sequentially. Mom, when pregnant, comes in, gets carrier screening. If positive, then that dad gets testing. And, and then he could have VUS as reported, but not the reverse. You did it in the wrong order. So how do we think about supporting an entire ecosystem of carrier screening that's effective and follows guidelines that needs to be couple-based, and what if the partner changes, then do you have to re-go back? So I think there's a whole area of research just around effective carrier screening, how to move it to preconception, and, um, and how to do it couple-based. Um, so then we there was a number of discussions around um, how do we make test results most useful and understandable to the ordering physician, especially as we engage more non-genetics providers. Um, uh, defining the value of, we, we talked about this just in the session this morning, the value of EHR integration for improving the utility of genetic testing. Um, also, labs cannot provide care recommendations that are specific to a patient, yet the physicians all the time ask, well, what do I do with this result for my patient? So what are the options and how can we study ways to actually achieve the guidance to a physician that they want without the overstepping of a lab who doesn't have the expertise to make lab uh, gut care recommendations? So are there models to pair lab reports with physician consultation? Um, what de clinical decision support tools could be developed to guide decision making after a test result? And that guidance may differ based on the variant level evidence, based on the confidence of causality. Does this you know, finding correlate with the patient's phenotype? as well as guidance based on patient choices. And we talked about, you know, with the same result, two different patients may want to do two different things based on lots of factors, perceptions of risk, importance of certain outcomes. So I think, you know, really studying how we make results useful and understandable and, and consumable by both physicians and patients is critical area. Um, and then uh, we certainly touched on supporting a genomic learning healthcare system how should patients be consented for genetic testing to ensure the most robust learning from the data, ensuring that ClinVar submission can happen? Um, but going beyond that, to, to which is really not happening today, is sharing case-level data, the genotype, the phenotype. Uh, right now, phenotype sits in the healthcare system, and the genotype sits often in external reference labs. How do we marry that data and have a flow into a 
gene to phenotype repository. And um, this is critical for defining the phenotypes of rare diseases, their expressivity, their penetrance. Uh, a great example I put here is the Decipher database. This is based on real patient data. It's publicly accessible to see aggregate phenotypic data on very patients with pathogenic variants. So that's a model, but how can we really funnel all data and develop systems for that? Um, we need to create variant level queries and share data in real time through federated approaches. So how can we implement this kind of network of sharing? Uh, and then Bob and I were talking yesterday around just like consent to share data with family members, which is critical in genetics. So how do we implement that as well and learn from cross family members? Um, and also we have really no mechanism today for how physicians or patients can provide data back to the lab after they've done follow-up and clarified the significance of a variant through perhaps clinical testing like an enzyme functional assay, imaging, metabolic studies, or even results of segregation testing where they don't always give the phenotype on the family member back to the lab and, and how do we transmit um, in a useful way that doesn't burden the physician, doesn't burden the whole system, which is definitely an issue. Um, then we, we touched on briefly this, the notion of genome, genome reanalysis or also really reuse as we think about genomes being used for multiple purposes. So what type of infrastructure is needed to most effectively support reanalysis and reuse of existing data? What if data was generated from one lab but secondary use or reanalysis happened in another lab or clinic? Do we need to develop universal quality metrics to determine when data is analytically valid and doesn't or does require orthogonal confirmation. So how do we think about that? Or do we simply share raw data and you just go back to the primary data? Um, you know, what are the best approaches? And what results can be used directly from a genome, like, you know, well-validated pharmacogenomic variants for queried upon drug ordering versus something that requires a professional interpretation based on new symptoms, for example? And this came up, you know, earlier this morning. How long is an exome or GM useful before technical advances indicate running a new test? And there's lots of models being developed for like these long-term use of genomes. But like, what is the utility? How long is that? Is it two years? Is it three years? Is it five years? You know, what are those sort of approaches? Uh, so that's everything I could think of. Um, happy to take uh, feedback as well as gaps in what I might be missing. We have a couple minutes for thoughts from about Heidi's uh, comments. <clears throat> Christine. Yes, <clears throat> yes I, I definitely agree with, with everything that you just said. Um, the bi-directional uh, communication between providers and the laboratory is something that has been very difficult to establish. We did it with the UDN and it's been very successful. Um, sharing raw data and then, you know, hearing what, because they have, you know, firsthand information of the patients and current information and seeing if that changes the interpretation. So would love to better understand that and have better guidelines. Um, and then reclassification and recontacting, mm -hmm. especially just effective mechanisms for recontacting recontacting patients because of, yeah. you know, losing contact and, and patients changing physicians is also really important. Yeah, I forgot the recontact. I'll add that in the list. Good point. Can, can I just follow up, Christine? Um, uh, how willing do you think laboratories are to have to do the extra work to get that information back? I, th I think they'd be very um, uh, amenable to that. Um, it, it could be through a portal. Basically, you um, deliver the results through the portal, the physician reviews it, and then, you know, check yes, no, um, you know, additional phenotype information that, you know, maybe has just come up. I think they'd be very interested and, in, you know, obviously it will help with um, variant classification in the future. And, and some labs do this well. Like we, we would only do uh, segregation testing if, and in fact, we, the way we did it was we did it for free for VUS is if they provided phenotype. So there are some ways to force that. Um, but but, and, and there also is an application, I think built through the CSER program from the Mount Sinai group called, I think it was Genome Diver, um, where it was a portal for the physician. Uh, and they initially used it when there was a set of variants that were candidates for the phenotype that were dependent on um, 
indications or phenotypes that might be in the patient and the physician could go in, kind of review the six candidates that came up and say, definitely not this. Oh, maybe that I'll do a test and see and, and provide that feedback. But that's a pretty intense sort of <laughs> way to do it. Okay, thanks. Um, so Bruce, we're really making you earn your... Uh, yeah, Josh. Oh. Go ahead, go ahead, Josh. Um, I really liked your recommendation to tie indication to the test. Um, I, I wanted to ask if the downstream benefit of that would be to customize the lab report uh, to include sort of critical information like absolute risks or something that the providers would use, or is that really need to be that interpretation needs to be a separate layer and based on you know sort of laboratory rules, you really have to sort of keep it sort of reporting the raw data. So, so I mean, I might not totally follow your question, but you know, in the standard sort of uh, framework for diagnostic or symptomatic genetic testing, there's you know clear guidance that you you may interpret the variants for pathogenicity, but then you need to provide a separate sort of did I answer the physician's question with if they were asking for a diagnosis for a symptom, and that uses terms like positive, negative, inconclusive, different from pathogenic uncertain, et cetera. So there, there is that notion of a indication-specific interpretation. But with respect to um, the sort of probabilities, and uh, that, that varies based on what test it is. And it used to be something that, like, residual risk was always provided for carrier screening because you knew, and for CF, for example, because you knew all of the allele frequencies and what the variants you were testing covered. Now, for the expanded carrier screening, we just don't have that data on so many of the genes that you can't really effectively provide re residual risk. But there's clearly some areas where you can provide that for certain diseases. And so I think that would be useful, but I don't know how often it's done. <clears throat> uh, Bruce, before I turn it over to you, did you have your hand up for a question for Heidi? I did, yeah. Um, it was wondering whether it's realistic to consider having some kind of standardization or formatting of reports across labs. One thing that has struck me over time is you know, each lab has its own favorite way of presenting information. And if you're especially not an expert, which increasingly will be the audience, you could easily be misled by just not knowing where to look for the critical things. And, you know, if there was some kind of standardization that included like psychologists and design experts who are good at knowing how to draw the eye to the relevant things, it might actually reduce the possibility of error. It's a great question. I think it's been a real challenge because of the number of laboratories that use um, uh, commercial software platforms, whether it's directly through the electronic health record, like we had to use our own pathology you know, system that AP and CP used for reporting. Um, other labs use commercial platforms, whether they be you know, Fabric or Imagine or whatever. So I think there is some challenge. It doesn't mean that we couldn't get all these groups together <laughs> and really try to push on this. But, um, but you know, the, the systems that have to share with APCP systems, where pathology is a bigger player than genetics, um, may make it a little challenging for those integrated, you know, with a AMC sort of system. But certainly, so much of the testing is done by big external reference labs, most of whom actually probably design their own, that you could imagine, you know, tackle, trying to tackle this area. So it, it's, a, it's a good point, Bruce, and I, I think, some dedicated research to designing um, how to display information. And my point earlier about can we suppress VUS low or things that you shouldn't spend time on, I think that would be part of that research of designing the best report and, and where you put information to make sure it's seen or in some cases suppressed unless you're really savvy. <laughs> Okay, well, th thanks. Um, Bruce, I guess for your second presentation for the day, we're uh, anxious to hear about your thoughts on research follow-up to testing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, a couple of points to make. One is, 
inevitably there will be some overlap with what you've already heard. It's not so easy to kind of split this all out. Um, secondly, I had to step out a couple of times for other obligations, so it's possible I've, in fact, it's probable that I've missed a few things, but um, I'm sure others will help to fill those in. So, oops, and I make my slide. Advent. Oh, I see what's happening. Oh, but I, there we go. All right, so the, the first is on um, uptake of interventions. And although this overlaps with, I think, what Mark was talking about, um, before you get into what are you going to do with the intervention, you do want to make sure that realistic expectations have been set. And that brings us back to the consent process and the, um, the need for community engagement and um, recognizing the risk of false reassurance and um, making a distinction between clinical testing and screening. And, you know, I think there could be a value to research into mechanisms of obtaining con consent and making sure that there's an alignment between what the participant expects and ultimately what comes back. I think this point was made earlier also, but I'll just emphasize it. Um, you know, we have a, an opportunity as we look at um, these various um, kind of sets that are um, subjected to um, the research-based screening to generate data on penetrance. The data we currently have, which largely is derived from family studies, is likely to be biased. But also, we have to be a bit more precise about penetrance for what. I mean, penetrance is, is generally accepted to be an all or none thing. You either have whatever it is you're specifying to be the phenotype or you don't. But then again, what do you specify to be the phenotype? And when we say somebody is non-penetrant, um, maybe that means they didn't develop cancer, for example, or they don't have a clinical arrhythmia, but it doesn't mean that they don't have something that may or may not be important in their care. And so we have an opportunity, particularly as we identify people on the basis of screening to follow them longitudinally and begin to learn what exactly is the natural history of these conditions. And somebody who is thought to be non-penetrant may not be so non-penetrant if you really kind of look carefully into the um, phenotype. Uh, I also wonder, as we talk about generating um, screening protocols, uh, to what extent will the all of us data set be um, a context in which you can model this? So in principle, now, you know, a million, it's a large number from some perspectives, but it's maybe not such a large number when you consider the entire population. Um, but it is a very diverse data set. And for the some of the kinds of things we're talking about, the the risk is low, but it's not vanishingly low. It's in the, you know, couple of percent range, maybe. And one could imagine that you could take a, a kind of virtual population defined from the all of us data set and ask the question, well, what if we had screened these individuals for anything you might want to consider given the, the kind of genomic data that's available in that data set and realizing the electronic health records that have been shared are probably in fact, certainly incomplete. Um, it doesn't mean that because something wasn't mentioned, it wasn't there, but it still does give you at least some window on what the potential utility of having screen for that would be. So it just strikes me that it could be available for that kind of use. Um, I think point maybe has been made, but emphasized that cost and value is likely to be a moving target because costs change as technologies change. And so what's cost effect, what's not cost effective now might turn into something that is cost effective over time. Um, I think the point's been made that um, we need to standardize outcome measures and um, come up with ways to compare outcomes across different um, different studies. And I, I guess implicit in that too is you know many of the things that are currently done with um, population screening certainly it was true in our project um, don't necessarily have complete control of um, being able to follow outcomes. And you know, there may be some value 
to uh, modeling this in settings where the, part of the consent process involves also looking at longitudinal outcomes and um, so that you don't lose track of the participants as easily as it otherwise might be the case. And then finally here, um, the need for point of care decision support tools that can include genetic counseling, which um, I think often is the case in the way studies are currently done. And um, it can also include um, ways of integrating data into electronic health records because likely clinicians will be expecting that anything that they're going to use for clinical decision making is going to just be there in the electronic health record. And a point I made yesterday, which I really think is something that could be ripe for research is the development of AI-based um, systems. Um, because as I said the other day, I just don't believe that as we do more and more um, wide-scale screening that the genetics workforce is going to be scalable to be able to meet that need. And so um, coming up with ways to build systems that can handle most of the common situations, it doesn't mean that there won't be the need for people doing counseling, but it, it may expand the workforce in a way that we otherwise are going to have a very hard time accomplishing. The second area I was asked to look at was cascade testing. And I think there could be a, a lot of um, work done in, in how to facilitate communication of information through the family, um, how much of that can be done electronically, um, what are the best ways to equip somebody to communicate to the family, because inevitably that has to be done through the individual who is screened, because who else is going to know who their relatives are? And to look at what effect this has on family relationships. Um, obviously, family relationships will impact just the ability to communicate this, but then after the fact, it could affect family relationships as well. Um, I think this point has already been made, but just to put it in this context, um, you know, if you have family data, you have potentially the ability to look at the question as to why is the penetrance um, greater in some settings than in others? And um, are there modifying genes, for example, that could be relevant? And it, you know, it struck me thinking about this, um, all of us really is, is based on enrollment of individuals. And although you can encourage your family to enroll, I don't think that there's any current way of linking that they are your family. But I wonder if it something that should be considered as as an option to enroll family members where you do create linkages so you can actually begin to study this within the all of us context. I'm actually uh, was asked to head a working group for all of us on um, the application of, of the all of us data set for study of rare disorders. And this is one question I think we may put on the table as you know how it will be received, I don't know, but it does strike me as an opportunity. And then third, when much of this has already been talked about, and particularly by Heidi, transportability through the lifespan, this question of um, reanalysis versus resequencing and, and how the technology surely will evolve over time and, and the fragmentation of healthcare. And then the question of where do sequence data live um, in a health system, which currently I think often might be the case, but if it were, uh, mo most people probably don't go through their entire life connected with just a single health system, if in fact they have any health system that they are connected with. Um, for those that participate in research, it may exist within that research enterprise, let's call it, but um, how available that will be for use outside that context is probably quite limited. It's possible that, that you could you know, provide the data directly to individuals. Of course, um, it's a big data set, but there may be ways that that could be the case on um, you know, some sort of um, memory system, um, whether that's practical and will people remember where they put it and that sort of thing is certainly a, an open question. There could be so-called, what I'm calling anyway, DNA data banks that come into existence, which span institutions. So you don't have to worry if you move to another city and establish your care somewhere else, that the data that was collected about you at the last place is unavailable to the next place. Um, or there could be, and maybe this is encompassed in that commercial entities that exist specifically to ensure that 
data are available wherever and wherever you tell them you want it to be shared. The last thing I'll I'll do, and you know, you probably can't read this. I actually can't looking at my computer screen even, but I'll tell you what it is. And it it was done on the fly, so I wouldn't claim it's it's in any way complete. Um, but it's looking at things in a <clears throat> kind of a flow chart, and it takes into account um, on the top here is the population. Um, and I can't quite read it because it's obscured, um, but it was the laboratory. And then it was the health provider and a, a geneticist, speaking broadly, whether it's a counselor or geneticist. And then horizontally is the process of engagement. And I guess I could say engagement and consent, um, then screening, um, then the outcomes, and then future use. And it sort of tries to establish a flow chart and in the margins are some of the kinds of research questions that can be addressed that are relevant to um, these different areas. And like I say, it was done on the fly, so it's almost surely gonna be incomplete. Some people find this to be a, a good way to organize information. Some people don't like it at all because it sort of forces you to put things in boxes which don't always fit really well. Um, so it, you know, I presented just for, you know, as a possible way of, of organizing information, but, um, you know, we can see how useful it turns out to be. So I'll stop at that. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Um, are there any specific questions or thoughts related to what Bruce has just said? Um, just really quick, I want to highlight two challenges um, with using um, uh, prospective cohort studies to study the penetrance of, of uh, pathogenic variants. Um, uh, so uh, the first is just the numbers issue. I was sitting here what, during Bruce's talk running through my head in terms of like how many carriers are there likely to be, even in all of us, which is a really big study. Uh, I was doing it for the... <clears throat> NCI's Connect for Cancer Prevention cohort, uh, which is much smaller. And the numbers are, I mean, they're there, um, and they're both very diverse data sets, which is, which is a great opportunity, but the numbers will still be small. Um, so this is, a, again, it's a surmountable challenge. We have 15, 20 years of, of uh, experience conducting collaborative studies. So no one study is going to be able to, to provide this, but uh, across many, we can get that information. And the second is, um, uh, you know, every cohort is going to deal with its own ascertainment issues. Um, so I don't know that all of us is going to be strictly representative of the U.S. population. There's, you know, who enrolls um, is going to be just a little different. Um, uh, but that, again, is a, a surmountable uh, uh, challenge by linking back to um, the, the enrollment population. Or the, uh, you, can, you can either see what happens in the U.S. general population, or if your target population isn't the whole U.S. population, it's maybe, you know, folks who are living in New York, you could probably reweight the results to be appropriate in that setting as well. So challenges, but not insurmountable. Bruce, a reaction to that or? Well, yeah, I think it's certainly true. But, you know, what it's worth, you know, we took a look since I have an interest in neurofibromatosis. How many people with NF are in all of us? The answer is it was like 160 or something, you know. So if you're going to do big modifying gene studies, that's not enough probably to be statistically meaningful. But on the other hand, um, you know, got 160 free whole genomes now um, in this population. And, you know, it's it's worth something. And I think for some of the traits we're dealing with, the numbers may be pretty significant, and for sure others it won't be. Um, so, you know, it, there's no study we can do short of sequencing everybody everywhere that is going to get completely around that, that challenge. Terry. Um, thanks, Bruce. You, you know, I have to say you're, you're really doing an incredible service to us sitting up in a hotel room locked away with a, with a very small genome um, invading, invading yours. So thank you so much for, for doing this. 
Um, I, I wanted to react to your comment about using the All of Us Research Program to model some of, of the you know, conjectures that we currently have and, and maybe point to a, a paper that's coming out in today's New England Journal. I'd love to take credit for you know, having read today's New England Journal, but actually um, uh, this was sent to me by Gail. Uh, she and Sharon wrote a, um, uh, Sharon Plon wrote an editorial on it, and it's entitled Actionable Genotypes and Their Association with Lifespan in Iceland. And what the Icelandic group did was to take the ACMG 73 at the time, because that's all there were when they were starting this effort, um, and basically identify everybody there. I, this is the way I've, I've interpreted it. Please forgive me if I've gotten it wrong. Um, take everybody there who had pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants in them, put them in one box, and, and then everybody who didn't in another box, and compare lifespans. And there was a three-year difference in, in lifespan, which is, is really quite interesting. I'm not quite sure what it means or how we would act on it, but it seems to me that's the kind of, of research that could be done with some of these large biobanks. And I, I was just curious as to, as to whether you know, people thought there were other kinds of questions that might be answered in, in databases like this. Definitely, a quarter million people, not a million people. Well, so that's, no, that, the Icelandic study was in 60, 60 70,000 people. So, Dan, you have to get <coughs> the, the Icelandic study was at about sixty or seventy thousand people. So yeah, it's it's it may be two hundred thousand. They have the advantage that they follow them for a hundred years, so they know about mortality. Fifty-seven, fifty-seven thousand nine hundred. So, so, so eventually, yeah. you know, all of us, UK Biobank, all the other biobanks that are, <laughs> that have that have large whole genome sequences should be able to do this. But uh, Carrie Stephenson has been doing this for a long, long time and has all those records. So. We should be able to do it. You're right. True, but but you know, can we go beyond that analysis to do some others, maybe more? You know, they they then separated out the cancer right. genes and said most of the people years, who had them died of. Cancer. Excuse me. Most of the people who had those variants died of cancer. Um, so so yeah. So the, what other questions would you want to answer, Dan? <laughs> cardiomyopathies. Oh well, yeah. Uh, they they allude to the cardiomyopathies, but I think that most of the data were in were in cancer. I think, but they have. I mean, they have a. A graph that you know sort of follows people's from the day they're born till the day they all die in their 90s. So, you know, it, it, I mean that's a pretty impressive uh, and detailed and long-term follow-up. So it'll I think it'll be a while for some of us to be able to do that. Yeah, I suspect a fair amount of that is modeled rather than actual. But um, but again, have to look at it more carefully. Mark. Yeah, I think it's also um, important to recognize that not all penetrance is created equal. And what I mean by that is that uh, effect size uh, can sometimes uh, uh, trump numbers uh, uh, in when we're looking at a uh, bias versus an unascertained population. Just, just to demonstrate that, a little audience response here. Uh, how many people think that the uh, incidence of uh, infertility in Kleinefelter syndrome males is uh, above 90% show of hands. No one. Okay, is that just I don't know? Or how many don't know? Okay. Okay. Well, I can tell you that in medical school, we were pretty much taught that individual Kleinefelter syndrome are infertile. Well, when we did our copy number study at Geisinger uh, and uh, identified uh, a couple of tens of uh, Kleinefelter males, uh, nine of them have families. Um, and uh, we don't think all of that is non-paternity. Uh, uh, we haven't demonstrated that definitively yet, but it raises the idea that, well, we only had 30 people, and yet we saw a signal of a phenotype that we didn't expect to see that was really quite dramatic. So um, uh, in any case, that's the, the, the point of this being that if we think about what is the purpose of screening, then perhaps these big impact phenotypes are really the thing to uh, be looking at. And the other point related to that was the um, uh, penetrance of what that was raised in one of the comments. This is something that's come up in the ClinGen Action Ability Working Groups where we have genes and we have several different things that are potentially actionable based on outcome and intervention pairs. So as, as we discuss them, we say, well, it's this one, this outcome intervention pair that really drives whether or not this gene potentially has clinical utility and actionability. And the other ones, while they may have an importance to the individual, 
uh, they're not the driver for where the health benefit could be. And as we assess the complexity of uh, the gene phenotype relationships, we need to be thinking about the, the large impact and the ones that are uh, likely to have um, uh, the, the, the biggest impact on health outcomes, recognizing that other health outcomes may in fact contribute small amounts to the benefit or utility of an intervention. Okay, uh, just to ask the broader crowd here, is, is there anything that you can think of that wasn't covered by the three presentations that we've heard today that would be good to add on to this list? <clears throat> Karen. I can't remember if Heidi included it or not, but the conversation we had with Bob about aligning better aligning the, the standards in the EHR space, clinical space with the GA4GH research space to facilitate the genomic learning healthcare system. Was that in there, Heidi? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, anyone else? Yes. Sure. Um, something that I think came up a lot more yesterday, and, and forgive me if it was in one of those presentations, but um, is that the concept of false reassurance and just the number of negative results and the, the power that studies could have to dig more into that of how big of a problem that is, what's happening, and, and also how can you help m mitigate those risks better? Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that. I was really struck yesterday by the number of times people mentioned the false reassurance problem. And, uh, you know, it, obviously, in the context of do no harm, false reassurance is not a good thing. So um, that should, great. Okay. Yeah, I think that was in my list here somewhere. Yeah, and, and I might add just a, a teeny caveat, just as, and I've forgotten, was it Mike who was talking about, you know, penetrance is not only, or in, incomplete penetrance is not only genetic and, and pointed to smoking. Um, I, I think we, we do have non-genetic many examples of false reassurances that, that patients take away from, you know, your blood pressure is normal today, your blood sugar is okay right now, you know, what, whatever. Um, and and it, it, there's not a lot of angst in the clinical community about that. And, and <laughs> you know, there probably should be, but there's, but there's not. But again, you know, I, I, I think we do ourselves a disservice, and my friend to my right will probably speak to this, in, in focusing so much on the harms that, that are not unique to genetics. So yes, we should focus on harms and yes, we should avoid them, but, but let's not make it appear as though this is such a dangerous thing compared to everything else we do in medicine. Uh, Mark. The way I might frame that is, again, taken from Les's talk, which is this is not exceptional. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, because we've had, we've come out of 30 years of thinking about this as, as exceptional, we tend to default to an exceptional position. And so I think an overarching um, theme to remind ourselves of is that, you know, this is medicine. Uh, and, and so we, we shouldn't treat it, it as exceptional unless there's extraordinary evidence to suggest that it is, in fact, exceptional. If I could just just follow up on that, I'm reminded of the the missing heritability days. You know, back in 2009, I saw it flash by here once or once or twice, and I remember presenting this to our advisory council, and the the non-human geneticists said, "Why are you guys getting so excited about this? I mean, in Drosophila, you explain 30 percent of a of a trait, or in you know, in this uh, model organism or that model. Or luckily, Carol isn't here to to uh, <laughs> correct me. But but at any rate, we we do I think do a, a, a little more self-flagellation than, than perhaps is good for the field or for the science. John Cook. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think this just general, generally points to the need for better education and, you know, communication of what the results really mean. And I, I suspect if we looked at other screening tests that doctors do, patients misunderstand their negative results or don't even know that they had negative results or what they meant at all. And so I, I, I agree, it's probably not exceptional, <laughs> but we could we could uh, model good behavior for the rest of our colleagues in yes. how to communicate the meaning but, of the negative result. And maybe that's the research is comparing our experience to some others. Les. 
Yeah, the way I like to say it is I have never met a surgeon who's afraid of scalpels. <laughs> um, we are the only specialty in the academic healthcare center that seems to be more afraid of its own technology than anyone else that practices medicine. It's just utterly bizarre. We have a very robust, well-funded industry of people whose job it is is to come up with any hypothetical negative risk uh, uh, harm of genetics and genomics. And risks and harms are real. And if you do anything, if you touch a human patient, you have a risk of harms. And the only way to avoid harms is to not take care of patients, which is another harm. So, um, you know, the, the, uh, the Isaac Asimov quote, I think, applies, right? The, the, ignor the uh, uncertainty that comes from ignorance is not the same as the uncertainty that comes from knowledge. And we can reduce harms if we take them all into account. Uh, we can absolutely do that. Bob. Just, just one brief comment that um, unlike blood pressure testing and um, colonoscopy, you know, there, there, there are a lot of tests that, are, that one expects to do again there are also tests that if the result comes back weird, you just say, well, let's run another one. I don't think genetics is in this category, and that does mean that it has to be treated a little bit differently. Not entirely correct, but in some cases it's correct. The persistence of the data. I mean, there are times when I'm sure, Christine, you get second, and yet Heidi, you get repeat. You know, this can't be so, and and so you send it send it back. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Um, I think we're going to move into the final wrap up here, and so I'm going to turn it over to Terry. Yeah. Uh, good. So this should look like laying the groundwork, and I guess I know I'm screen sharing. I don't care. There we go. Um, so so the, we, you know, talked a little bit about this uh, early at the you know, beginning of the session this morning. These are a series of things. It's too dense, I'm sure, for you all to, to read. I can put it in, in full screen, but then I won't be able to see it at all. Um, so, uh, sorry, just a moment. I'm trying to get rid of a box that won't go away. My colleagues had the same problem. So anyway, um, so what we will do is, is, you know, pull these together, share the slides with you, and and as uh, you know, as well as a, as a white paper. But just to kind of run through them um, before you all take off. Um, we, we heard about basic principles of testing for disease and risk. They are different, and genetics is, is now moving into or could move into the, the risk testing, which is different from testing for disease, um, and the importance of disease prevalence in the predictive value of test, which has been done in clinical medicine for, for a long time, not always appreciated. The, the goal of genetic testing and reporting, we heard, would shift from, from sort of consoling people that now you have this diagnosis, you need to adapt to it, to actually motivating health behaviors to reduce the risk that we we've identified genetically in the cases where that can be done. In many cases, it can. Some it can't. Um, we, we did hear some consensus around screening strategies addressing Tier 1 conditions. We also heard that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has been added to Tier 1 conditions. If there is a reference on that, I'd love to have it, because every time I pull up CDC Tier 1, I get those three. Um, and yes. Okay, yeah. And, and then every now and then you see HFE uh, hemochromatosis as, as another one. So. Um, Clinical utility, I think everybody recognized, needed to be the sine qua non for, for um, Im implementing uh, genomic screening um, and recognizing that if you return these findings, they should prompt interventions that result in improved health. Medica medical action ability, just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do it. So um, engaging the population and engaging the expertise should drive the list for screening. Um, and Mike made the, the excellent point that APOL1 and TTR are more important in some populations than others. It's hard to choose uh, or to know who exactly is going to have these variants and who isn't, but I think those are, are important considerations at least to keep in mind, especially as we heard yesterday, American Indian, uh, Alaska Native groups found only five of the, the genes on the um, ACMG list uh, being relevant to their population. How one defines that is a, is a matter of debate. 
uh, timelines and milestones for population screening will be important, um, and uh, be, I'd love to hear people suggest what those should be. Also, some standard criteria, we've been calling them the Richards criteria for selecting screening tests and populations to hold them in. Um, research on when we do and don't need either genetic counseling or, as, as Heidi mentioned, genetic counseling assistance, which is a, a, another area, uh, how to incorporate individual patient preferences. Uh, we heard, did hear some suggestions about AI and online tools and how those might be used, and, and I think we, we do want to try to harness those, um, uh, particularly given that genomic data are in some ways uniquely relevant to AI because they are so massive and, and a human can't you know, manage all three billion base pairs. On the other hand, you can manage the five or six variants important to your patient. Um, and we heard several times studying the biology of penetrance and, and the evidence needed to prove pathogenicity. So I've kind of ripped through those. Um, is there anything up here that gives people like real pause or that I got completely wrong that you'd like to modify? Richard's criteria, do you mean Wilson and Younger criteria? No, I think that the comment was made, um, and I guess I can't get out of it. Yeah, that was me. Yes. What did you say? Uh, so basically, we do variant interpretation using a standardized set of class. class yeah, so we do the classification, and that the probabilistic um, uh, uh, assessment that you had uh, um, suggested. Uh, indicated that there could be pieces that you could plug in. And so it was, and I didn't want to call them the BSECR criteria since those already existed um, in terms of exclusion, um, but, um, but, but that was the idea that there, we could create a uh, um, scoring sheet, if you will, where you would say, here's the information you need to plug in uh, to be able to make a determination regarding that. That was the point. Yeah. All right. So everyone's okay with this? I, I, <clears throat> Sorry. You know, um, one of the things that I heard today that really resonated and I hadn't really sort of thought through was why uh, HBOC screening is so much more effective than anything else. And it's because of the efficacy of the downstream intervention. So, I, you know, I, if you'd asked me yesterday, I would have said, well, we should add TTR because obviously there's something and there's an intervention. but whether that intervention is anywhere near as effective as a, as a an oophorectomy in a 25-year-old who's destined to get ovarian cancer it, it is, remains to be seen. So I, I think that's the, uh, that's something I learned today. And, mm -hmm. uh, no, that was, a, that was that an excellent point. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Great. All right, I'll see where we can work it in. Okay. Moving on, um, on the genomic screening technologies, uh, we, we heard a number of lessons learned, and, and slides will be available on the website. Um, I hope those of you who prepared slides knew that we were going to provide them um, publicly, but at any rate, um, lessons that have been learned in optimizing high throughput screening um, and, and testing, and also uh, the need to, to be very careful about adopting technologic advances uh, and establishing, establishing quality metrics, which we've done for research sequencing and, and clinical sequencing and should be for others, uh, other tests as well. Uh, we need research, as, we, as I mentioned this morning, on assessing compound heterozygotes. I hadn't really even thought of that, Bob, and you brought it up, and I think that makes perfect sense, especially when the second is one that has not been well interpreted. Uh, distinguishing early from late onset forms of disease in terms of when one screens and what one does about it, um, as well as the potential for pre-symptomatic management, um, which obviously you'd love to catch somebody before they develop um, disease. That's the whole point of prevention. Um, there, there's vast inequity in variant interpretation as there is in almost every other thing we do in medicine, but in, in particular, uh, I think this is an area where, where genomics stands out because of the terrible databases that we have currently in terms of underrepresented groups. Um, and something that, that I, I think will, will improve over time, we, we do have a 500,000 uh, person, we don't, um, but Africa is developing one under Ambrose Wancom and, and other groups, and Meharry is working with, I believe it's Regeneron, um, to develop one within medical schools. Uh, T4C, yeah, so, so those will help with African ancestry and, and African American, there, is, there are still, as you know, you know, four sixths of the of the world's population that that isn't covered by that that really needs to be. Um, 
let's see, need to figure out handoff. Oh yes, uh, this came up multiple times about what, once you have a positive test, you know, how do you make sure that people actually get into care and what is that handoff? And, and that I think we heard could be, you know, researched in a way, should it go to primary care, should it go to this group, should it go to that group, um, whatever. Um, but that, that's a, a real opportunity, I think. Um, better estimates of prevalence of monogenic diseases from biobanks, and John, Jonathan may have mentioned that. Uh, recognizing potential harms of false positives, we've heard about several times, um, and consider the number needed to harm, um, which I, I don't think we, we look at um, as, as much as, as perhaps we might. Uh, it may be much smaller or much greater than we think. Uh, a lot of talk throughout the two days about um, uh, the negative testing, how people interpret that, what's the role of genetic counseling in that, um, and, and what kind of follow-up is needed. Uh, Dan made the point that patients with a very few, uh, very clear phenotype, a, a long QT interval, whether they have the known genotypes or not, you're still going to follow them. Somebody who's having many, many polyps, they're still going to need colonoscopy, whether they have known variants or not. Um, but perhaps those without a phenotype don't need um, either genetic counseling or much in the way of follow-up. Um, and, and that those, again, are researchable questions that could be looked at in existing biobanks. Um, and then the importance of linking back with our, our basic science colleagues. We had a whole genomic medicine meeting, number nine, on uh, linking basic and, and uh, clinical scientists and you know engaging with some of the uh, large-scale databases that are trying to interpret uh, variants and, and their relationship to function, uh, high throughput assays, et cetera. So uh, is there anything here that gives anyone pause or that you'd like to add to? You have your little thing you have to do. I don't. Oh, okay. No? Okay, did I exhaust you? I see one. Yeah. Okay, nothing on the, no, nobody, no hands in the Ujigabi. So, okay. Uh, yeah, and those on the, on the web, if you just speak out, if you want to. Uh, logistics of population screening. Sorry, Terry. Sorry. Just taking a second to digest. Oh, you went I, through them quickly. I did. In quotes where you have considered the number needed to harm. Mm -hmm. Can you state that? And when you read it, you know, if someone's reading this without an understanding, sort of yeah, well, about so, the number needed to cause harm. So you just might want to oh, yeah. that. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, number so so Ned, th this was your idea. I can't think of how to f how to f f say it because it's number needed to treat, number needed to screen, number. Needed. Could you put your? If you say number needed to treat for a benefit, then you say number needed to treat for harm. To treat for a harm. Yeah. Okay. All right. I can do that. Thank you. Still, it still, you know, does seem awkward, but um, yeah, there, I'm sure there's another way to say it, like the number of screenings that are so, the how many screening. Oh yeah, it's the same as well. You could say the attributable harm risk if you want it. It's important to specify the harm, and if you want to use the health, health economic term, it's disutility. That's a disutility. little bit dry. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. All right, we'll put that as a, you know, just so that when this ends up in the Washington Post, we, we won't be I'll, accused. I'll, I'll, I'll put a phrase together that has the, the attributable risk and, quote, number needed to harm. Yeah, okay. that's a little bit easier. That way, it puts it in the same vernacular as number needed to treat for a bit. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll send you something. Oh, you'll send me something. That yeah. even better. Okay, great. Uh, um, thanks, Aaron. Other comments on this? Okay. Uh, going into logistics of screening, um, a lot of discussion about who manages the results. That was alluded to earlier in terms of who follows up on these things. Um, and uh, the excellent point that was made about barriers to specialty care are even greater than barriers to primary care in disadvantaged communities, something that I think we don't always appreciate. Um, uh, Primary care physicians shouldn't be expected, or providers shouldn't be expected to become genetic counselors, uh, looking at multiple models, not only for clinical decision support, uh, but also for referrals and, and that sort of thing. Um, consider meeting, uh, uh, this was Carol's suggestion, um, that perhaps we should have a meeting of both genomic medicine believers and primary care leaders, because we were sort of railing about, gosh, how do we get you know primary care providers to take this up? Well, let's not try to understand a little bit of what 
the various perspectives are, how we weigh the, the evidence that's available, and how we look at benefits and harms of this to, to try to address the skepticism, which would be an interesting thing to do. I, uh, it's something we, we do have a convening power in, in, uh, at NHGRI, and we could consider it. Um, repeatedly, we heard um, from sort of many, many stakeholder uh, communities, guidelines need to be simple um, and easy to follow for patients, providers, payers, um, uh, clinicians, everyone. Um, we need uh, meaningful engagement of communities, and we heard a lot about this. Uh, the point was made, disparities start in utero. You might even start at, say, preconception, but, but at any rate, um, they are pervasive and um, uh, need to be addressed with the communities affected. Um, the, the excellent point made, and I think you know, we heard about this through the Penn Chart Initiative, that uh, integration with clinical care can improve lots of things if we make these data available to all the clinicians that touch a patient within a system, as well as to the patients themselves. It can improve access to screening and follow-up. Um, we heard about identifying and, and maybe e examining past harms that have happened, particularly with genomic screening, and then uh, avoid, if we can, building them into future systems. And the research grant gaps, again, repeatedly uh, incorporating the need to incorporate social determinants of health, which are, you usually cannot get from the electronic medical record, uh, but need to find some ways of, of collecting those, identify and, and limit barriers to participation, and incorporate throughout principles of equity. So I think with that, um, I'll <coughs> ask if anyone wanted to change anything up here. I can take a breath, yeah. I'll take a sip of water. Any any additions or modifications? Okay, I only have twelve more slides, so it's okay. <laughs> so, uh, did I skip one? Community engagement. Um, yes. Well, and, and I, I think we've talked a lot about a community engagement. Uh, I'm I'm not going to you know walk through all of these, but as was mentioned earlier, only five ACMG variants relevant to to one population that I had not realized was as large as 5.2 million in the U.S. Uh, so a group that we, we definitely need to address. Um, and the point was made, when a, when a patient is referred out of, the, out of that community, are they getting the tests that they need? Are they getting tests that are even relevant to them, you know, testing the, the variants that are appropriate for them, et cetera? Uh, the, the fact that there are other underrepresented communities that do not have the kinds of organized um, uh, consultation and, and governance structures that is characteristic of uh, uh, AI and, and um, uh, tribes. And, and communities, and so how do we, I don't know that we can address that, but, but you know, who, who is it that is the community and how to, how to um, engage them? Um, and the point being made that the policies that govern uh, research and public health are quite different. I mean, Bob made a, the, the point, um, uh, Bob Courier, on, on one of our pre-meeting calls that, that, you know, once the state mandates something, the state, as I'm paraphrasing, takes responsibility, a lot of responsibility for what happens in, in that um, and needs to be very, very careful to avoid and reduce harms. Am I saying it correctly? Excellent. Okay, great. Um, and the sadness about uh, evidence-based med medicine methods that have remained, you know, unchanged, didn't fit, so fixed um, for more than 12 years at least. Um, what evidence we need to get to more conditions to add on, and the, and the very intriguing idea of, of, you know, finding systems that are appropriate healthcare systems that could test. Um, you know, sort of pilot those that are almost ready. And one of the challenges being, whenever you look for the, you know, the really appropriate, ready, well-resourced um, um, institutions or healthcare systems, there's a whole community of people that they do not serve, that we need to understand how to serve so that we don't you know, exacerbate inequities. So, but um, is that something that we could do um, to, to strengthen those or to reject them? Um, the, the importance, which seems pretty obvious, but you know, I'm, I'm not sure I've seen it uh, emphasized, the importance of engaging patients in developing educational materials um, and uh, uh, results reports so that they're interpretable and understandable and that they don't convey you know, completely the wrong messages. Um, and that engagement is not enough. We need true co-creation and participation throughout a project. Anything here that people would take issue with? All right, just two more. Uh, evidence needed to support screening. Uh, we heard about value from Mark this morning um, and a, a nice definition of that. Uh, and the, um, the need to identify health in outcomes that are important to patients as well as to 
clinicians. I think, Mark, I've heard you make the point multiple times that, uh, you know, our, our systems essentially define outcomes based on the, the power people, the people who drive it, and that's often the clinicians and not the patients. Um, not that that should be, you know, determinative, but it's something to at least be considered. Um, I, I thought it was interesting David made the point uh, about confirmatory testing. The cost is really relatively trivial um, after you do the, the, you know, the test on everyone if you're only pulling in one or two percent of the people. As he said, you know, amortized $100 test would, would only be one or two dollars per person for, for that. So that's a, that was a good thing to, to recognize. And I think we tend to see, you know, 250 cost for whole genome sequencing, whatever, and then 250 for confirmatory tests. We go, oh my God, $500, you know, times 350 million people. We can't possibly do that. And that's not what, what the, how the math adds up. Uh, false reassurance, again, we've heard about uh, how to combine conditions to get good value because testing more than one is, is clearly um, more cost effective. And we saw that in the Gazaskis paper and, and in others. Um, interestingly, engagement of the leadership is a strong predictor of clinician satisfaction with the effort. I might have thought the other way around, that, you know, if, if the leadership is forcing you to do something you don't want to do. Um, but maybe I'm just a, you know, a cranky, cranky person. Um, but, but at any rate, that was, and I, and I think, you know, part of that is that good leadership would, would actually make sure that it works for people rather than, you know, and, and set up whatever resources they have available to, to make sure that it's smooth and, and feasible and, and all of that, as opposed to, you know, coming up from the grassroots, you may not have the authority to, to make the changes you need to, to have something be, you know, smooth and work in your workflow. Um, Carol made some good points about the perils of paternalism and how, you know, clinicians consistently predicted you know, much worse outcomes than patients actually did. Um, you know, and the, the, you know, much greater concern. It was, you know, they predicted 35, 40%, you know, great concern or reduced quality of life or whatever. And, and you know, only five to 8% of, of patients actually reported those things. Um, so, so I think that those are important to keep in mind, you know, whose perspective we, we want to listen to here. Uh, and, and she made the point, who mistrusts whom in, in this? Um, it, may, it may not all be in one direction. Um, we've heard for years, I believe, uh, about how do we get genomic or sequence data to follow a patient across uh, medical systems and throughout their life, and we're still struggling with that. I, I, have, I have a vision, so, so having seen the, the um, pharmacogenomics testing that was being done in Europe as part of a clinical trial, it, they had a QR code on their, on their phone and they, you know, scan the code and, and they can basically have access to their data. They're, we must be able to do that. I mean, I, you know, Amazon can tell you everything I've ever bought from them, for, you know, <laughs> for, the, <laughs> for the past 10 years. Um, so we've, we've got to find ways to be able to do this. Um, and uh, noting among the payers, if there is clinical benefit, there really is cost is less of an issue as long as there is clinical benefit. Um, but really reducing harms is one of their biggest concerns. Um, and if you screen people at younger ages where prevalences are lower, you're going to have more false positives. That's our friend Reverend and Bayes. And so uh, how to deal, make that balance. Um, and then um, the interesting idea of, well, gee, you know, you could take the, the newborn blood spot and sequence it at age 18, or you could sequence it at birth, but then not provide the results until um, that child is a, of the age of majority and ask if they're interested in it. Uh, Mark made the point that, you know, that's when you have the least interaction with them in the medical care system. Um, I would posit it might even be, you know, until age 30, you don't see much of them, at least, at least the males. Yes, yeah, no, exactly. Um, but, you know, how about disconnecting that from the healthcare system and, and looking at, you know, when, when you go to vote or getting a driver's license or whatever. Um, and then um, uh, some suggestions on post-testing interventions for high-risk people, so finding the right follow-up models, uh, helping patients and providers understand the recommendations and increase uptake. So that, that seems, you know, a major implementation barrier we need to address. So are the things in here anyone would like to modify? I'm not sure the younger ages thing is correct because um, I think actually the opposite is true, right? It's the reason why if you're looking at Wilms tumor screening, uh, screening WT1 mm -hmm. in 80-year-olds, mm -hmm. false positive, the false positive rate is high because you they should have had the disease, right? Yeah. So I think right. actually that, that's not correct. Right, because the genome doesn't change. 
Okay. That's the, yeah, because the, the prevalence of the risk fixed. factor. The prevalence of the risk factor is fixed. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yep. Silly me. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, my, so can we say it might get more downsides, or we're not even going to say it's going to? Somebody made this point. I swear. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. <laughs> so, so did anyone make the point that screening at, at younger ages could have downsides? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah and that's because of the quality. You get more years yeah. of life added if you detect the disease at a younger age. So he showed it breast cancer was effective at 20, but it wasn't effective at 40 years of age. Right. So, so that that's not a downside. That's an upside. That's the reason for doing it. Yeah. Yes. Is the is the years of quality you add, not because the, the okay. prevalence but, is different. So I'm the one who, I'm, I'm the reason for that bullet point. That um, oh, so, right. uh, I mean, yes, <laughs> it's all true. <laughs> um, uh, it sort of depends on what the intervention is. So the, what I had in mind was, as opposed to um, prophylactic surgery, if you were going to recommend people to get screened, like to do mammography screening at earlier ages, because the incidence is so low between 20 and 30, there might actually be false positives, right? So there's, I think there is a potential risk for mm -hmm. sort of looking too early. Okay. I mean, it's sort of like you gave the example of if you're looking like past the age of onset, it, that doesn't make any sense. And the flip side is if it is a later onset disease, you, there might be anxiety. There's like nothing. You're, like, you're, just, you're just like waiting for the shoe to drop until you're 35. That's cost-effectiveness. Maybe you could turn. There we go. The cost effectiveness study did actually show that it's slightly less cost effective if you were to screen at 20 versus 40. And the reason is, is that you're um, doing screening interventions well ahead of when you are anticipating having the results. And so, again, if you think about the condition by condition, for familial hypercholesterolemia, you'd want to do that screen in the first decade of life. Um, but in, for um, hereditary breast ovarian cancer and limb syndrome, if you screen too early, you incur costs without any incremental benefit in that uh, period of time. And so right-sizing screening uh, intervention timing, and that was, I think I captured that on one of my slides that I sent you about the understanding the timeline of prevalence and tailoring the screening to that timeline. Yeah. And there's also yeah. sort of a practical <laughs> issue that, that my friend Ellen Clayton always points out because she's the mother of two boys that men between the ages of 18 and 40 just don't go to doctors and just don't do anything. Women have gynecologists, but men don't do anything. So, so you have to think about how to, if you're going to do it at 18, how to counsel people to pay attention is a big challenge, I would think. Maybe move it to bars. <laughs> there you go. Yes, yeah, absolutely. OK, great, thank you. Um, and then uh, the obstacles to screening session, uh, which was our last session before the, the three um, uh, earlier summaries, uh, we did hear that, uh, again, payers care, care more about health outcomes than cost savings, although not, uh, maybe not all of them would, would are acting that way. Um, but anyway, uh, they, uh, uh, it was noted that there, you know, when, you do, when you're doing screening, you're asking the payers to take on the, the upfront cost of the screening and, and maybe getting very little of the benefit. Um, if, if people are only in their system for two years. On the other hand, they do pay for, you know, hypertension treatment and, and cholesterol lowering, the benefits of which accrue over decades. And so there's a, a little bit of a disconnect there, and it'd be interesting to try and figure out, you know, why and now 30 or 40 years, what, of, of uh, research, Dan, and into low cholesterol before people were convinced, and some were still not convinced, um, and, and hypertension treatment, et cetera. We don't want to wait that long for this. So... Um, everyone will prefer simple, low-cost, and low-risk screening, if only. Um, and the point being made that the USPSTF is, is weighed very heavily by these, these groups, which is good to know. And it was great to have a colleague from our Office of Disease Prevention uh, in, in the meeting. Um, and we, we can continue to work with them. Uh, a number of research opportunities on data and terminology standards, uh, types of derived data, knowledge management. Um, and um, we heard, and many thanks to Kate and, and Dan for, you know, basically a roadmap to a genomics-enabled EHR in the Penn Chart Genomics Initiative. And they, they have made many of those materials available. We very much appreciate it. Um, there's a, a website that we can probably add. Kate had sent it to me, so we can, we can include that as well. 
Um, and she, you know, she, she listed you know, a, a very nice list of challenges, both anticipated, you know, okay, we need to start small, we'll walk before we can run, and, and unanticipated that there actually was a lot more demand for dissemination than they had expected. Um, and then uh, several points about incorporating equity into implementation science, uh, which is a, a useful thing to do. Anything here we'd like to modify? You look thoughtful, Jonathan, are you? No? Okay. Great. Um, I won't go through these. These are the ones we just heard, so, so we'll, we'll leave those aside. I do want to, now with my, my remaining few minutes, um, to give many, many thanks to the planning group, which was Jonathan, yay, Jonathan, um, Gail, uh, Bruce, and George, uh, who are, I'm sure, with us in spirit. Um, and then many thanks to the, to the people who helped make this meeting possible, Jenna Cohen from the ACMG, Alvaro, uh, Brandon, who I didn't see at the meeting to, today, but we appreciate his, his background support, McCool and, and Gerald, and then uh, Jonathan Narula, Riley Wilson um, from, from my group, who are taking what will be an excellent summary, I know, uh, and Meredith Weaver from the ACMG. So, and think, Emma and Lindsay from UNC for the PDF booklet. Oh, yes, Lindsay. Yes, who's up, to... up there with, yes, hi, Lindsay. So great. And all of you for coming and for staying to the bitter end on what I understand is a very nice day outside. So we should get out and, and try and enjoy it. Rex, do you want to have the last word? Just to thank everybody. I thought it was a great meeting and uh, see you all next time. <laughs>